بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه أما بعد فإن أطغى الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم وشر الأمور محتفاتها وكل محتفة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Very well praise the due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise him and we thank him and we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil of our souls and from the evil results of our actions. Verily, the one who Allah Ta'ala guides, there is none who can lead him astray. <coughs> and the one that Allah Ta'ala causes to go astray because of his misunderstandings, because of him following his whims and his desires, there is none who can guide that individual aright. Point number two in the Aqidah of Al Imam. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah ta'ala as given to Shu'ayb ibn Harb Al-Imam Sufyan said Wal-Imam qawlun wa amalun wa niya yazidu wa yanqus yazidu bil ta'a wa yanqusu bil ma'afiyah wa la yajuz al-qawl illa bil amal wa la yajuz al-qawl wa amal illa bil niya ولا يجوز القول والعمل والنية إلا بموافقة السنة الإيمان سفيان said the second point is that الإيمان is action and statement and نية or intention it goes up and it goes down. The iman of the believer goes up and it goes down, it fluctuates. It goes up by him obeying Allah. And it goes down when he disobeys Allah. And it is not permissible <coughs> to make a statement except that that statement should be accompanied with action not permissible to make a statement except that that statement should be accompanied with action and it's not permissible to make a statement and action except that the statement and action should be accompanied by a near not permissible to make a statement and to do an action except that they should be accompanied by the near and it's not permissible to make this statement and the action and the near except that it is in accordance to the sunnah <clears throat> we'll start all over from the very beginning and iman is statement and action and near it goes up and it goes down it goes up when the servant obeys Allah and it goes down when the servant disobeys Allah and it's not permissible to make a statement except that it should be accompanied by action. And it's not permissible to make a statement and an action except that the statement and the action be, should be accompanied by the niya. And it's not permissible to make a statement and an action and the niya except that it should be with the sunnah. Shawa. <laughs> and then after saying that now now inshallah from the very beginning an iman is statement and action and near intention it goes up and it goes down the iman goes up and down it goes up when the servant obeys Allah 
and it goes down when the servant disobeys Allah. If the Iman is one, it's statements and actions and niya, these three things, then he says, it's not permissible to say a statement except that it should be accompanied by action. And it's not permissible to say, make the statement and to do the action <laughs> except that they are accompanied by the niya. And it's not permissible to do the statement and the action <coughs> and the niya except that those three things should be according to the sunnah. And we can always go back to the tape, inshallah ta'ala, or to the notebook of our brothers who have wrote, written it completely to get what we've missed. After that, Sufiana Sadi said, or Shu'ayn said to him, فَقُلْتُ لَهُ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ وَمَا مَوَافَقَةُ السُّنَّةِ After that, after hearing this statement, the point number two, Shu'ayn ibn Harb said, O Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah, what do you mean by the Mawafaqatul Sunnah? What do you mean that it should be according to the Sunnah? And then that led him into the third point that we'll do next time, inshaAllah ta'ala. In explaining this issue, Ikhwan, <coughs> this issue of an Iman, what is an Iman, <coughs> and the issue of it going up and down, again, it's another one of those issues that the deviants went off of the path and they went astray concerning it. <coughs> because verily, when you want to read the Quran of Allah Ta'ala, ta the actual speech of Allah, and whenever you want to read the Sunnah of Al Mustafa, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And whenever you want to read the statements of the companions, it's very clear to the child that an iman goes up and down and that iman is deeds and actions and statements and niya. But if you want to be a person who, you want to be a murji'a, or you want to be a mu'attazila, or you want to be from the asha'ira, then what you have to do is, you have to take the Qur'an and the Sunnah and you have to play with it. You have to throw curveballs. Or you leave the Qur'an and the Sunnah altogether and you start taking your delil from the books of an adab, the books of poets, the books of the men of letters. Because when you look in the Qur'an, this issue is not an issue that you brothers, inshallah, are not going to find any <laughs> difficulty in understanding because your minds have not been polluted with deviancy. Concerning this statement, an iman is sayings and actions and niya, the explanation of that is simple. The ulama of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they give a definition of an iman, and everyone has to write this down. It's very short, and it's more important that you understand it. Al Iman or faith is Al Qawl bil Lisan to profess with your lips or profession professing with the lips. Say La ilaha illallah Muhammad al Rasulullah. That's one, put an A or one next to that. And Al Iman after that is Al-Amal The working with your body parts Whether it's your hands Whether it's your fingers Whether it's your feet Whether it's your legs Whether it is your tongue It's working with your body parts And the third aspect in the definition of Al-Iman Al-I'tiqad bil-qalb And it's belief in the heart The people have different understandings of an iman. Some people say that an iman is belief, period. <coughs> Some people say that an iman is an un, knowledge. Some of these people say that an iman is a ta'ah, being obedient to Allah, doing the things that Allah told, tells you to do. So these three things that we just said, 
is what al-iman is to ahl sunnah wal jama'ah and it will help you to understand the statement of Sufyan al thawri first of all the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the authentic hadith al-iman jad'u wa sab'oon shawba adnaha imatatu al-adha an al-tariq wa arfa'uha qawd la ilaha illa Allah the Prophet said in this hadith an iman or faith is 70 branches the highest branch is or the lowest branch is taking something harmful out of the street wherever you have the Muslims using the street or a walkway the lowest branch of an iman is for a person to take glass or anything harmful out of the street that's the lowest branch or level and the highest level is saying la ilaha illallah this hadith shows us many things number one it shows us that an iman is saying with your tongue saying la ilaha illallah if a man does not say la ilaha illallah or the equivalent to that he does not come into a slap how does he become a Muslim without pronouncing or professing Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah even if he was to do the deed if we, he does not make this profession then his Islam is suspect so this hadith shows us that the highest form of iman is the statement la ilaha illallah so that's indicative of the first part of the definition that iman is making this statement also in the hadith when the Prophet said that iman the lowest part is taking something harmful out of the street that cannot be done except that he goes and he bends down and he grabs it with his hand and he throws and he makes movement he doesn't do it with telepathy he doesn't do it by wishing the thing that's harmful in the street is going to be elevated and pushed out of the way he actually does a deed where he goes and he puts something out of the street with his hand so Iman is working with your body parts and lastly the third part and Iman is an iqtiqad with your heart believing in your heart the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said من قال لا إله إلا الله مخلصا من قلبه دخل الجنة whoever said لا إله إلا الله sincerely from his heart he will enter into paradise after knowing this it's strange for us to find the statements of these different groups the first group that you brothers have to write about is the مرجئة المرجئة Al-Murji'ah Al-Murji'ah They come from the word Al-Irja Which means the Ta'khir To make something prolonged To put something back The Murji'ah They believe Again as we said before That if a man Simply recognizes That Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala Is one and Allah is the Lord And he has no partners Then this man is a mu'min He's a total believer. His faith is like the faith of Jibreel. His faith is like the faith of Abu Bakr. His faith, whoever believes in that, then your faith is complete. And you don't have to do anything to prove your Islam. If you didn't pray, if you made zina, if you smoked crack, if you drank whiskey, if you lost other people's money, whatever you did, you are still considered to be a believer because you recognize the fact that Allah Taala is one. We also have a group called Al Quraniya. Just spell it how you want to spell it. Al Quraniya. Al Quraniya. K A R R A Y. Al Quraniya. How do you want to spell it? Anyway, Al Quraniya. Now you can spell how you want. K A A L K A R R. Spell out every one. Al Quraniya. They believe that an iman is simply saying La ilaha illallah. 
if you say it, whether you believe it or not, you are a believer. Which also doesn't make sense. Actually, the people who say that just to say la ilaha illallah you're a believer, why doesn't that make sense and why doesn't Islam support that view? But I'm saying from the Quran and the Sunnah, or from the reality of what we live in this dunya, why does not that definition stand up when we put the asset test to it? Does anybody know? Now, no, but I'm saying why? What's the clear evidence and proof against that? Now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Iblis would be a believer that. Uh, and there's something other than this, and that is that the Munafiqun say La ilaha illallah. That's all they say. They say La ilaha illallah, but they're not Muslims, they're not believers, they don't have Iman. But these people were extreme deviants, the Quranian, who said if you say La ilaha illallah, khalas, no one can do anything from you, your blood is safe, your money is safe, you're like a Muslim and you don't have to worry about anything. Another group is the group and Mu'tazila. Everyone knows about the Mu'tazila. <coughs> and Mu'tazila. <coughs> and lastly, the Khawarij. The Khawarij. The Khawarij. Al Khawarij. These last two groups of Khwan still. That an imam is doing those things that Allah ordered you to do. Someone may say to me, So what's so important about this? Why does the enemy of the past make a big deal about it? What happens, Ikhwan, is based upon what these people understand, there are ramifications that come as a result of that. For an example, as we said before, the murji'a. If a person was a murji'i, he would find pleasure in drinking wine and getting high, and he wouldn't have any problem with doing this evil deed, and then getting up in the morning to make salat of pleasure. <coughs> and you would not be in a position to come to him and to say to him, this is haram, because he says, iman is one thing, my faith is one thing, and my actions are another thing. As far as the Quranic are concerned, they say, if the believer does not do what Allah has ordered him to do, then he's not a believer and he goes out of Islam and he's a Kafir. So then what they'll do is they'll proceed to pronounce takfir on the people based upon their understanding of Al-Iman. If you didn't do what Allah Ta'ala ordered you to do, like make salat, like give zakat, make that halal is halal and haram is haram if you didn't do that they'll say since you have no deeds you have no iman iman your Catholic and the Khawarij another deviant they said that the person who didn't do the deeds he wasn't a Catholic nor was he a Muslim but he was suspended in the middle somewhere and all of this as you can see it doesn't make sense. It doesn't come along with the easiness of Al-Islam. One of the things that the characteristics of Al-Islam is that when you read the Quran and the Sunnah and you really concentrate on the issues of the Quran and the Sunnah, you don't find that they're difficult to understand. You don't find that they make your face do like this and they make your heart say, what's going on here? What's the problem? What are they talking about? The message of the Quran and the Sunnah is very, very simple and very, very easy. Now the people say, this is a problem of a long time ago, and people are talking about this, what are we studying it for? The brother brought this book about Abu Hanifa, and we told you brothers that Abu Hanifa was from which school of thought in the issue of Iman? al Murjia. He felt that Iman was something and the deed was something else, you didn't have to do anything. So this man wants to defend Abu Hanifa, so he said, and listen to this carefully. He says, to begin with, <coughs> the Imam does not regard duties and actions as part of faith. 
It is superfluous today to discuss this point. For even a man of common intelligence today knows that faith means belief, which is a state of mind, while duties and actions are over exercises of the human organs, the two categories being just disparate and incapable of combining or forming part of each other. So the man is saying that the common guy today, the regular Muslim who's not a scholar, today he knows that an iman is a state of mind. It's what you believe in your heart. Whereas the actions are what your body parts are doing. So the iman is one thing and your actions are another thing. So when the person picks up this book, and he's a brand new Muslim, and this is a lot of the type of material that is available to brand new Muslim, had it not been, alhamdulillah, for what al Hidayah is doing, and, you know, this new trend of making sure that things are under Quran and the Sunnah, this is what we had available when we came into Islam. We had Yusuf Ali, books like this, the Tabriki Jama'at books, and the man reads the book, and he doesn't know this is right or this is wrong. So he picks up this book, and he believes or he is reading that this is actually putting forth the understanding of the people of the past. So I'm going to read this book. I just wanted to read that point, but it's more than that. And I would advise you brothers not to read this book, this book in particular, because the man is a straight, and he's calling to that which is a straight. As for the good things in the book, alhamdulillah, but for the most part, the aqidah of this man is off, and he's a hanafi muta'asr. The ones who we always say, be careful and stay away from that type of situation. So now, Ikhwan, and Imam Sufi and Asari, he told them what an Imam was. So when we look at the statement that we just put forth, an Imam is cold, where the person says, La ilaha illallah, it's a statement. And it's action, like taking the thing out of the tariq, like making salah, like giving zakat. An Imam is having a niyyah, with good intention. The Prophet told us, you got to get that book to that man. <coughs> <coughs> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, إِنَّمَ الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ Verily, the deeds will be judged by the intention. This iman goes up and it goes down. It goes up when the servant <laughs> obeys Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And it goes down when he starts to disobey Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. Now all of you in your Islam up until this point, Many of you brothers who reverted back to Islam, if you've been in Islam for two, three, four years now, I'm sure you can recall the time when you first came into Islam, you felt that you were very, very high. If you had a job and you lost your job, you weren't worried about where the money was coming from because you're Iman and Allah, you knew Allah was going to take care of you. When you came into Islam, you felt all the Muslims were like angels and they were doing the right things and you can marry from them and they're marrying you and like this. And then after being in Islam for a while, you start to see that in terms of what we know, things are less than what we know. So we start to feel like our, our Islam, as individuals, our Islam is not like the Islam from when we first came into Islam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses the abs. When an individual comes into Islam, Allah makes it easy for him because he has no knowledge, he doesn't know. So Allah Ta'ala makes this situation a situation of bliss even though he's jahi, he's ignorant. Because if he came into Islam and things were very, very difficult, he'll leave Islam. Anybody coming to Islam in Ramadan? I thought you were born Muslim and you remained a Muslim and so forth and so forth. A few months. When a person comes into Al Islam in Ramadan, he comes into Islam and then the people say to him, You have to fast. If he comes into Islam in Ramadan, he'll find that this may be a fitna for him to stop eating from the time that the Muslims eat. But in spite of that, when he comes into Islam in Ramadan, he'll still find that that first Ramadan, more times than not, was easier for him than the Ramadans that came after it because Allah Ta'ala out of his hikmah makes it easy for the man. So now for a person to come and to say that this Iman does not go up and does not go down, he's rejecting the Quran, the Sunnah and the reality by which he lives. Now I'm going to give you brothers some ayats and some surahs that you should write down and you should go back to look at them. <laughs> These ayats that show us clearly 
that a man, the iman of the human being goes up and down. First of all, in Surah Ali Imran. Ali Imran is what Surah of the Quran? The third Surah of the Quran. Ayat number 173. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala tells us about an incident in this ayah in which he says, الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمَ النَّاسِ إِنَّ النَّاسِ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُ فَزَادَهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ Those people, meaning the companions, who the people said unto them, Verily all of the people are gathering up against you, to come against you, so be afraid of them. So their iman was increased, and they said, Allah is enough for us, and He is a good wakil. <coughs> this is the translation of the ayah. What happened was, in one of the battles, all of the people, the Ahzab or the Confederates in the Arab Peninsula, all of them decided to come together at one time to go against the Muslims in Medina. So the Prophet وسلم, had the khandaq or the ditch built around three quarters of Medina. Of course, the mountain of Uhud is behind the backs of the Muslims. So since Uhud is from there to there, the Prophet built the ditch from there all the way to there, three quarters of Medina. Because they knew, in terms of numbers, they didn't have the ability to go out to meet these people and walk. So they built the ditch and they made it so that if they crossed the ditch, they will only be able to cross in numbers where the Muslims can defeat them. The Muslims can kill them every time they came across the ditch. Before this happened, the Kufar inside of Medina, from the Arabs and the Munafiqeen, and from the people of the book, the Jews, they said, they all of the tribes coming together and they're going to kill them. So the Muslims said, Allah Ta'ala said, when they heard this, they increased their iman and they said Allah is enough as a wakil for us. The Prophet said in Bukhari that our Ibrahim والسلام, said the same thing. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. When did Ibrahim say that? When they threw him in the fire. This was the statement of Ibrahim. So now, the point is, this ayah clearly shows us, according to the Quran, that the iman can be increased because when the Muslims heard that statement, their iman was increased, as Allah said in the Quran. So now it's not befitting for anyone after that to come now and say, the iman doesn't go up. The next ayah... I think it's 173. What did I say? I said 173. Yes. Now, the next surah is Surah Al-Anfal. Al-Anfal. Al-Anfal is what number? <coughs> number 8. Surah number 8 of the Qur'an, ayat number 2. The spoils of war. Surah Al-Anfal. Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Surah, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Allah tells us in describing the believers, those who have Iman and those who believe in Allah. He said, verily the believers are those. When Allah is mentioned, their hearts become frightened. And if His signs are rehearsed unto them, their Iman is increased. And they depend on Allah. There's no ayah clearer than that. This issue is very clear. And alhamdulillah, you brothers don't have any problems with it. Especially when Allah says it now. Surah number 8, ayat number 2. Surah number 8 of Surah Al-Anfal. Allah says in the Surah, Verily the believers are those who, if Allah is mentioned, their hearts become frightened. And if His signs are rehearsed unto them, if the Quran is read, then their iman is increased and they depend on their Lord. The next proof to show that the iman goes up and down is in Surah Al-Tawbah. Surah Al-Tawbah is the ninth Surah of the Qur'an. Ayat 124. Ayat 124. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا مَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةً 
فمنه من يقول أيكم زادته هذه إيمانا فأما الذين آمنوا فزادتهم إيمانا وهم يستبشرون Allah Ta'ala says in this ayah and if a particular surah is revealed those kufan munafiqeen they say whose iman has been increased by this ayah whose iman has been increased by this surah making mockery Allah Ta'ala said as for those who believe their iman has been increased and they accept the good news the next proof is Surah Al-Ahzab. Surah Al-Ahzab is what Surah? Now, Surah 33. Ayat number 22. Where Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala tells us, وَلَمَّا رَأُوا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْزَابِ خَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَاتَّدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا Allah Ta'ala tells us in the surah that you brothers insha'Allah can go back and look in your own Qur'an at a time that's convenient for you and when the believers saw the confederates or the ahdaf in the war that we just told you about they said verily this is what Allah and His Messenger promised us and Allah and His Messenger have spoken the truth and it did not increase them except in Iman and in submission. So these are four of the many ayahs from the Qur'an that tell us about the Iman of the person being able to increase and being able to decrease. Now, Ikhwan, we want to ask this question and we want you brothers to write and to answer. In terms of the Iman going up and down, Many of us, for the most part, are in a situation where more times than not, our iman is going down. More times than not, we feel low. We don't feel that we're in the mood or a position that anything that happens to us today, we're in a position to deal with it because our iman is high. So the question to you now is, what are those things that we can do to make our iman increase according to the Quran and the Sunnah. What are the things that we can do to make our iman increase according to the Quran and the Sunnah? Now to the deen. The zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you have a proof for that now to the deen? No, it's okay. I can, you don't have to say it in English. I mean, you can even tell me something that we all will agree to. Now that's number one. Write this down. Ways to increase the iman. Number one, the recitation of the Quran. But the thing concerning the recitation of the Quran, Ikhwan, is that we don't want <coughs> to read the Quran just for the sake of reading the Quran. But we want to read the Qur'an with contemplation. We want to read the Qur'an with understanding. Right now, all of us read the Qur'an, alhamdulillah, to some extent. Some more than others. But how many of us read the Qur'an with contemplation? Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala in the Qur'an encourages us to read the Qur'an with contemplation in so many ayahs of the Qur'an. For an example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ إِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِي اخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا Will they not contemplate the Qur'an? Not just read it. Will they not contemplate the Qur'an? For verily, if it has been from other than Allah, it will be much discrepancy. They will be in the Qur'an much ikhtilaf. So we want to read the Qur'an. And we want to stop this trend that's been going on since we find all of these books that are being translated. Books that depend upon what's authentic and this is a good thing. 
But now it seems like the brothers are placing more emphasis upon this hadith is authentic and this hadith is, is fabricated more than they place emphasis on memorizing the Quran. So the person who's been in the in al Islam for two years and up, he should have memorized Jews Amma by now. If he's been in Islam for two years and up, he should have memorized Jews Amma by now. Because even though you're a new Muslim, and even though you may not know Arabic, this is taken into consideration. You are like the child who also doesn't understand a lot, but he still has the capacity to be sent to the masjid or to a sheikh or a half of the Quran. He has the capacity to sit in here and to memorize without even reading, without the ability to read. Your child who's four or five, you should start him memorizing at that age. When he goes to the masjid or the sheikh, he cannot pick up the Quran and read it like this. Now, from listening to what you say to him, he picks it up like that. No doubt his mind is clear because he doesn't have the problems that you have. But what is our excuse because after this two year period? If we look at ourselves, we'll find that we wasted a lot more time on things than other than the Quran. So there's really no excuse except if the brother has a learning disability. And inshallah that's not the case. So if you've been in Islam for two years and you've been trying to practice Islam, by now you should have memorized Juz Amma. So what happens at Khwani, in the lesson that we're doing now, the lesson could be appreciated more if people knew something of the Quran. But because we, the brothers, are generally people who don't memorize. We don't memorize. It's not a part of our minhaj. It's not a part of our Islam. We don't memorize. There's not a desire that a brother has to say, by the end of this month, I want to memorize Surah to Qaf that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi always read on Friday. I want to memorize Surah to Sajda. I want to memorize Surah to Nuh so I can have this adilla to know how to give dawah. I want to memorize this or that. We don't have it. If you were to ask the Quran in any particular setting, a group of so-called filthy people, Ikhwan, give me five hadith from the message of Allah in Arabic. Five hadith. Sometimes a hadith consists of no less than, no more than five or six words. No more than five or six words. It can be in the masjid of 40, 50 people. Well, why they can't bring you five hadith? They can't bring you five hadith. We showed you, Ikhwan, again, that we need to be careful about walking around on this earth with our chest put out like this looking at everybody like, I'm holier than you are. Because wallahi, we fall short of the mark. We're not really on the threshold of being students of knowledge. So the issue is serious. So I advise you brothers, everyone, to get you a small Quran, those of you who can read Arabic, to get you a small Quran and start to try to live with Allah's book. Start trying to memorize the Quran the Quran that Allah Ta'ala said he made it easy to be memorized when Allah sees his servant opening up the Quran and he's having difficulty in doing it Allah Ta'ala blesses you twofold and he makes it easier for you the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in the authentic hadith الذي يقرأ القرآن وهو ماهر به مع سفرة الكرام البررة والذي يقرأ القرآن وهو يتتعتع فيه وهو عليه شاق فله أجران. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim on the authority of our mother Aisha. The Prophet said, whoever reads the Quran and he is an expert in the recitation of the Quran. You know these tapes that you hear? Al Husari, Abdul Bafit, Al Hudayfi from Medina, Al Shurain, all of these tapes, these people are experts with the Quran. Whoever reads it, like, reads it like that, he will be raised on the in the company of the angels. And whoever reads the Quran and he finds difficulty reading it, and he stutters while he's reading, he doesn't know Arabic, so he stutters while he's reading and it's difficult, he'll get a double reward. So Shaitan, he rips one of us off by making you think, I don't know Arabic, so I can't memorize the Quran. That's number one concerning the Quran. Number two, Ikhwan, the Quran can't be memorized by that transliteration. 
So if you're trying to memorize by that transliteration where they spell out Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen A L slash H A M you're not going to pronounce the letters right. So you have to, if this is your situation, sit with someone so that he can correct what you're saying because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. So now I reiterate, if you've been in this land for two years, then your understanding of the diet to Salafiyah in this aspect falls short of the mark. And you should be embarrassed that you haven't memorized Jews Amma. The Jews Amma, the last serious part of the Quran, where little children, little children in the Muslim countries memorize and they walk around with it in their heads and in their hearts and they don't understand what it's saying. But really whoever can memorize it will have a lot of their little from it. Number two, what is another thing that can cause our iman to increase? Ahmed. Number two, reading about the sunnah and the seerah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Reading about the sunnah and the seerah or the history of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an about the stories that He gives to us in Surah to Yusuf. He tells us about what happened to Yusuf, what took place between his brothers, how they finally came to Egypt, and Yusuf was in a place of authority and respect. And then after that He tells us the stories of some more Anbiya prophets and their stories. Throughout the Quran, Allah is telling us about the people who went before us. And this is one of the reasons why. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that Surah Al-Ikhraf, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ تَعْدَلْ Surah Al-Quran It equals the third of the Quran. One of the reasons of the interpretations of that hadith is that the Quran is made up of three things. Number one, the Quran is going to tell you about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and His description. What Allah does and what He doesn't do. What are His names and what are His characteristics? Allah is powerful. Allah is all knowledgeable. Allah is over His throne. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is all seeing, all hearing. Throughout the Quran you're going to get this message. The second message is you're going to get the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us what happened to the people before. The history of the people who went before. These people did that, and these people did this, and as a result of that, they're going to be here, and these ones are going to be here. And thirdly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran about the reward. What's going to happen in Jannah, and what's going to happen in the Nam. No one is going to bring something else outside of these three things. These are the three issues that Allah talks about in the Quran. So when you look at the surah, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say he, Allah is Ahad. Talking about the description of Allah. The name of Allah. Allahu Samad. Allah the Eternal. He is a Samad. Lam yalit wa lam yulat. He is not begetting nor does he beget. He doesn't beget nor does he begetting. Description of Allah. Telling you about how he is. What he can do. Wa lam yakun lahu kufu wal ahad. And there is nothing like him to him. So this is the third of the Quran because it talks about the third that we told you about where Allah talks about himself. The second third that we mentioned is the issue of the history of what happened to the people before. So in Surah to Yusuf and many other surahs in the Quran, after Allah Ta'ala tells us about what happened to those people, He said at the end of the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبَرَةٌ لِئُرُ الْأَلْبَابِ There you have in their stories an example for those who have intelligence. If you take the Muslim today, who reads the Quran and he reads it and he just reads it like this, but he doesn't contemplate the message. He reads Surah to Yusuf, a beautiful story. A story that tells us about the importance of how do we judge in Islam. That tells us about the fitna of the woman. So many, the, the importance of the da'wah to at tawheed So many messages. You ask the Muslim today, I think you read Surah to Yusuf. <coughs> if he read it, because many people haven't read it, 
He said, yes, I will sort of to Yusuf. You say to him, what did you get out of this story? What did you get out of this story? He says, I got out of this story that Yusuf was a handsome man. He didn't read the Surah. He didn't understand the Surah. And that's all that he came out with. So likewise, Ikhwan, when we read the Sirah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we recognize, and then his wife Khadija, and then his cousin Ali, and then his friend Abu Bakr. And they were the first four Muslims for some time. And then after that, three more people came in. And they were the first seven Muslims, eight Muslims for a long time. But in spite of that, they had an understanding and they had a commitment that today the Muslims number over one billion people. So now the brothers here who want to affect change in writing, for an example, they want to put the true dollar on the map. They see that HT is doing this and these people are doing that and there's so much confusion. They want to put real Islam on the map. They look at themselves and they say, now we number in this room 22 people. 23 people. And if we compare our numbers to the numbers of the Prophet when he first started, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and when we compare our money and resources to the monies and the resources that he had, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will no doubt have to say we're better off. We're better off. So therefore, let us not be faint-hearted. Let us go out and take care of business. This is what the believer does. He compares himself to his situation and he moves based upon that. But again, it all has to do with the Iman. They had a certain understanding and level of Iman and commitment that's different from ours. And that's why with the large numbers of the Muslims today, in comparison to them, with the amount of money that the Muslims have today in comparison to them, with the abilities that the Muslims have today in terms of technology in comparison to them, the Muslims can't do anything about moving al-Islam as a ummah, as a group. So that's the second thing, that the people look at the seerah and they read the seerah of the Messenger of Allah. Probably the best seerah book that you can buy now is the book by the Sheikh from al Madina, Ziya Ikram, what's his name? Does anyone know the name of that man who wrote the book about the history of Medina? And then there's another one who wrote the Sahih history? Yeah, yeah. What's his name? Dia, Dia Akram. That's him. Dia Akram. Because he took the time out to establish the authenticity of what has happened. Whereas you find these other books by the life of Muhammad by, what's his name? Haken, Haken. He puts everything in there, and you never know what's right and what's wrong. And the other history books, even this Rahif al Mahtoum, some things that's in that book are not correct, that's been translated. The next step, what is it called? This book is a good book, but you have to be careful when reading it because there are a lot of issues in there that are not authentic. Someone else give us something that will cause the Iman to increase. Then you go, Khani. Go ahead, uh, the time of the Sahaba sent the Prophet them, and he said that when I'm alone, my Iman will not my Iman. I feel weak. And the Prophet said that um, the wolf devours the lone, the lone sheep, so therefore we should come to the to the Jamaat. That's how that's how the Hadith went. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that we should be with the group. The hadith said that the, the man, his name is Hanzala, he went to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and he said, oh, Abu Bakr, verily Hanzala is a munafiq, I'm a munafiq, I'm a hypocrite. Whenever I'm with the, with, with the, with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my iman is high. And then when I leave the Prophet, my iman goes down. Abu Bakr said, I experienced the same thing. Let us go to the Prophet. So they said to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we're with you in your presence and we hear you talk, we're, our iman goes up. And then when we go and we with our wives and our children and we start going in the affairs of the dunya, our iman goes down. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you were able to keep your iman up where you were when you're with me, you will almost be able to shake hands with the malaika. It's proof. It's a proof for what? 
the proof that the Iman goes up and down according to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so the same thing that happened to Abu Bakr and Hamdallah happens to us and it shows us that what? we are not Malaika and that's why it happens to us so in terms of you making this as a Jalil don't mix the two issues up um, now mm. what do you mean another one? we didn't use that one now the third one is to make dua we have many examples where the salaf used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for an increase in their iman part of the repertoire that you should put into your dua and many of us wallahi ikhwan wallahi it's a real it's a shame it's really sad because when we look at every single aspect of Islam and we compare ourselves to these aspects of Islam we know that we're in a sad situation because in almost everything we're falling very short of the mark when we look at the issue of Salah the issue of Salah it's not uncommon for an example in a room like this if we were to say how many people pray Salah on time today and we're not talking about Hanafi times you know, the sun is almost coming up, or it's already up. But it may not be uncommon for half of the room not to have made Salat on time today. If you were to ask the people, how many of you are married? The majority of the people say, no, we're not married. Okay, no problem, you don't have the ability to get married. How many of us have taken the time out to get sick and get married? To know about what our Islam requires from us to get the sick and the understanding in marriage. Why do you think Al Imam al Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawood, Al Tirmidhi, Al Nasa'i, Ibn Najah, all of these books of hadith, when you get them, you see that the Imam start off with the chapter of Iman, or the chapter of Al Tawheed, or how revelation began. And then after that, they'll do the chapter of Al Tahara, purity, cleaning, the chapter of Salah, the chapter of Zakat. The chapter of Siyam, the chapter of Hajj, and then after the chapter of Hajj you find that most of them will do the chapter of buying and trading or the chapter of Nikah. Either this or that. This one will put Nikah, marriage first, and then you'll put buying and trading. Or you'll put buying and trading first or Nikah after that. And then after that they'll put the book of Jihad. Why do you think that those women must sat down and they all made their books the same way? So that the Muslims of before will come to the masjid, they'll go to the sheikh and they'll sit down and they'll start teaching them their religion from the very beginning. Get your Sahara first. Get your Tawheed together first. Your Aqidah. And then after that, get your Salat together. Then get your Zakat together. Then get your Fasting together. After the Lord has made Hajj, inshallah, he's prepared now to get married. So he'll get sick in and nikah. How to get married. Or oh, he'll get sick in how to buy and trade. So that when he gets married, he's getting married with money that's halal. And then after he's done that, the book of Jihad. Many people, today they tell us, Jihad, Jihad, Jihad. Well, why? No one can come to you and talk to you about Jihad not being a very important institution of Islam. Many of the ulama to show us the importance and to place emphasis on Jihad, they say the six pillar of Islam is al-jihad fi sabi'ilah we don't need to talk about the ayat of the Quran and the hadith that tell us about the jihad but tell someone give me some fiqh of jihad jihad is more than knowing how to put an AK-47 together and to take it apart it's more than just shooting someone it's more than just killing someone it's more than that and this is why Quran all over the world, wherever you see the Muslims are fighting at, all over the world, particularly in Afghanistan, what happened there? Well, why it was the type of situation that caused power and honor and respect to come back to the Ummah. They were wiping the Kufa out. Wiping them out. And then when they took over, Allah Ta'ala gave them the nothing and the tamkeen. What did the Muslims do? They started killing one another. This guy, he's with the Shiite, so that he can kill his Muslims. And this guy is with the Sufi, so that he can kill these guys. This guy is with the communist, so he can kill this guy. So everyone is looking for the chair. Everyone is looking for 
They have turned out to be the ruler because the Muslims don't have jihad. So since I've been traveling around in England, I've been to Birmingham, I've been to London, and these different places, these pockets where you find that the brothers who go to make jihad, well, why we ask Allah to bless them? If their is sincere, Irregardless of whether a scholar so and so sees Bukhni as jihad or not, it's irrelevant. If your niyad is correct and you're going according to the Quran and the Sunnah, inshallah, you'll get blessed. But I've seen since I've been here that the brothers of jihad start to form a clique like the many other cliques that develop and form in the Ummah. And then after forming the clique, it's exclusive. It's a special club. And then when you go to talk, and you find out where the people's heads are, you find that they are some of the most ignorant people in their religion. Today, I had the unfortunate displeasure of meeting a Sufi brother who, when I moved to where I live at in London, in a place called Croydon, this man used to pick me up when I was walking down the street to take me to the masjid. And he used to speak to me very happily when he knew that I was new in the area and I was playing in the masjid. Those people allowed us to come there and to get some lessons. So we've been going there for the last few weeks giving lessons. Things now have gotten out of hand in that some issues have come up that they don't like. Anyway, the point is, after giving talks in the masjid, all of them stopped speaking to me and stopped smiling at me and stopped being my friend. So then this brother came to me and he started talking about the sheikh that he has, who believes in the, and who has the ability to know whether or not you have wudu. So whenever they go in on the sheikh, they are afraid. They think that the sheikh, you got to go in him with wudu. As if he is a lot, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, you're to stand before him to make salat. And he knows that you have wudu or you don't have wudu. So anyway, when we started to talk, the brother started to talk about the awliya and the karamat, you know, the miracles that can happen to anyone. Not just the sheikh. A big guy will have this ability to do a lot of things. So I made this similar tool to the brother and I put it forth to you brothers. If you take a man who comes into Islam or he's in Islam and you sit him down and you start to teach him the religion and you teach him Arabic language and you teach him fiqh, he knows about his religion, the fiqh issues, he knows hadith, he knows about tafsir, he knows about these sciences of al Islam. He doesn't have to be a scholar. The people have different abilities. So he knows he can wipe out his sock because of this and that. And he knows these issues of fiqh. When his wife comes off of her menses, does she have to take her braids out and not take her braids out? He knows the issue. You teach him these things from the sciences. When he comes and he sits down and he learns. And then you take another man. And his religion is built upon the shame and miracles. That's all he has. But he's ignorant. If you ask him about the turban that he's wearing, can you wipe out it or not? He doesn't know. He has a big turban and his beard goes down to his navel. He doesn't know. If you were to tell him, can you cut your beard? He doesn't know. How much can you cut off? What can you not cut off? So when you take the two products, this student and that student, and you put them in the dunya, any sickness that faces them, you'll find the one who got sick in the religion the proper way will be more equipped and better aware, more aware. Whereas the people who their religion is simply karamat and the sheikh, all their religion is, like many of us, I'm Salafi, I'm Salafi, I'm Salafi, but there's no effort to really get knowledge in the religion. What happens in Juan all the time, 99% of the time, the person will always find his iman is low, and whenever a sickness comes to him, he falls by the wayside. So now we're trying to say to the brothers, until we start to go to the different types of knowledges in this religion and start to go through them systematically, then there should not be any question or any concern. Or we shouldn't wonder why our situation is the way it is. So that's concerning the third point. Anyone wants to offer something else? The last one. Now, now this is one of the most important ones. Pondering about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Allah Ta'ala tells us in so many ayahs إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَاتِ اللَّيْنِ وَالنَّهَارِ وَالْفُلْكِ الَّتِي تَجْرِ فِي الْبَحْرِ Allah tells us in so many ayahs like a surah of Adam and Ra'an at the end of it Glory in the difference of the night and the day 
really in the creation of the night and the day and the difference of the in the very end, the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the difference of the night and the day, and the ships that sail on the sea by the permission of Allah, and the winds that blow the ships back and forth, are signs for those who reflect. Allah Ta'ala gives us so many ayahs telling us to look into His creation for sure. And lastly, Ikhwan, one of the most important ways to make your iman increase is a dawah in Allah. Making da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those of you who are affected by weak iman or iman that is low, when you start depending on the same people to come to teach you, the same people to take responsibility to teach you, when you start taking it into your own hands to go and to give da'wah based upon what you know, of course the person does not go outside of what he knows. What's wrong with you? listening to what someone said somewhere when he gave you an understanding in one ayat of the Quran what's wrong with you teaching that to another Muslim what's wrong with you going back to the people who you knew in Jahiliyyah who you were friends with in Jahiliyyah calling them to Al-Islam as opposed to waiting for the Sunday class or the Wednesday class or whatever class and the responsibility is on the same people if those people don't come to participate, there's no doubt. Alhamdulillah. The next point, Ikhwan, is the things that make the Iman decrease. And there are many as well. Abu Ahmed. La shak, Qiyam al was tahajjid from the best situation, but because they require more effort. And if we're not getting up for Salat al-Zuhr, Salat al-Fajr on time, and if we're not making Salat al-Zuhr on time, and we're not making the Sunnahs that are connected with Fajr, and the Sunnahs that are connected with Zuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha, then it's not realistic to think that we're going to be a people going to get up out of our bed the last third of the night, night to make Salat al-Tahajj. It's not, it's not realistic not going to happen. It is not going to happen. Here, when we look at the Salat that connected to the <coughs> Salat of Fajr, Zuhr, Asad, Maghrib, and Isha, they're easy because we're up already, but we don't do them. And it's not like we're leaving them for something else that's good. For example, <coughs> the ulama of the past, like an imam Malik, he gave a talk in the Prophet's Masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So after giving the talk, after Salat, after one of the Salat, <coughs> the Mu'adda made the Adhan. One of his students started to fold up his books and his papers and he got ready to leave. And Imam Malik said to him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get in the first row and to do my Nawakim, to do the Salat before that Salat, to do the optional Salat before the Raja Salat. And Imam Malik, Rahimahullah Ta'ala said, verily what you're leaving is better than what you're going to. If you left that Nawafu Salah to do this knowledge, you get more reward. Because knowledge is more important than this type of ibadah. If this is optional and this is optional, this is better than that. By text from the Sunnah, text from the Quran, Allah Ta'ala's Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, Fadru alim ala al-abid, ka fadri ala sa'id, ka fadri ala ajnaqim. The superiority of the scholar, the one who has the knowledge, over the one who worships Allah, is like my, the superiority of me over the lowest one from amongst you. Every hadith shows the importance of knowledge over the one who prays Allah. Now, it, it could be. Either way, you can, Iblis can work his thing in that situation. Either way. But the point is, if a person left in the Wafin, he prayed Salat al-Zuhur and he didn't pray any sunnahs after it because right away he went to start writing something down from knowledge or he wanted to get to a lesson. Then he left something good for something good. But our situation is not like that. Our situation is first, we pray at late. Secondly, we pray in our hearts not connected to it. Thirdly, after praying it, we don't do anything. 
or before prayer, we don't do anything. And everyone knows the situation. Now, how do you make it First of all, you can't have one of those jobs where you drive the taxi all day long and you're so tired out that when you send me for a lot, you're just thinking about, you know, moving the stick, driving it. Now, you, the, the son from the past used to, to not work jobs that was so strenuous to them that they had no time for ibadah or the ability for ibadah. So of course what the person does, the Quran, so many things that he can do. One of the things that you can do to make your salat better is to start connecting yourself with the Quran more. Contemplating the message of the Quran. <laughs> and when we say contemplating the message of the Quran, what we mean by that is <coughs> really trying to look into what Allah is telling us in the Qur'an. For an example, when we look at the story of Isa ibn Maryam and his mother Maryam alayhi salatu was salam, we all know that when a man and a woman come together, when they come together to have a child, who has the X chromosome and who has the Y chromosome? That's a question. I don't know, I forgot. Okay, the man has an X chromosome and the woman has the Y chromosome. So the X chromosome makes what? A male, right? An X chromosome makes the baby come out a male. And the Y chromosome makes the baby come out a female. And the XY chromosome makes it come out twins, huh? Something like this, huh? Not like that? How does it come out the twins? The female has two Y chromosomes. Now, now, this is it. Now this is it. This is it. Now, the female has two Y chromosomes, and the male has an X and a Y chromosome. So if the X, if the Y chromosome from the male hit the woman who has two Y, the child will come out a Y, a, a, a female. <laughs> and if the male, if the male comes out, if the X connects. Right? The X and the Y will come out a male. So, we find Isa ibn Maryam, his mother having two Y chromosomes. Right? Two Y chromosomes. And then there's no X or Y on the other side. So since she has two Ys, the child should come out a female. According to this saying. If she has two wives, so there's nothing else, if she's going to have a baby, it should come out two wives. But when Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, Kun, say your Kun. Khalas, that's it. So the child comes out a male without the father and without the wife. So when you look at what the ulama wrote in the past, especially people like Ibn al-Qayyim, the Sufis, they like to take Ibn al-Qayyim and say Ibn al-Qayyim was for us because he had the ability to look at an issue and to pull out for you all the treasures of the issue. But it's nothing that we can consi consider it to be esoteric knowledge. Not. It comes from contemplation. And it comes from people continuously rehearsing. So when you first read the Quran through, when you read it the first time, you get a message. When you read it the second time, you get another message. A third time, another message. The fourth time, another, and so on. As many times as you read the Quran, there's as many messages you're going to get. So if you only read the Quran once, and then you said, okay, khalas, I'm not reading it again anymore, then how are you going to be connected with Allah? And worse than that is the Muslim who's been in Islam for two years or more, and he hasn't read the Quran. If you were to tell him, Surah Taha, tell me some aspect of what Allah talks about in it. Mention one prophet and tell me something that happened in Surah Taha. He doesn't know. But he believes it's the Quran, it's the book of Allah, it's the book, but he doesn't know. So I try to encourage you brothers over and over again. Reconnect yourselves with the book of Allah even in English. Read the Quran over and over and over again even in English. And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala bless you. Wallahi, the more you read, the more information you'll get. So, concerning the way that the Iman goes down. <coughs> Ibrahim, what's number one? How does the Iman decrease? What makes the Iman decrease? The faith of the person. What makes it decrease? Neglecting someone. Thinking that they're going out to 
Now that's true, but instead of picking one, 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 we could just put it all under one whole heading. Now, disobedience to Allah, al maafiyah Disobedience to Allah will have to be put at the top of the list. Allah Ta'ala tells us in Surah Tushan, anybody memorize Surah Tushan? Who memorized Surah Tushan? Can you read it for Surah, Surah Tushan, Tahir? Now you know what Khalid in Jahiliya, if someone would have told you to recite some rap song, it wouldn't, you would have just went right ahead, Ahi. Now you get an opportunity to get blessings, and we get blessings for hearing it as well, Alhamdulillah. Yalla, ikra alayna, Surah Tushan. This part of the surah called the very he is successful, the one who makes this soul, he gives it, he purifies it. وَقَدْ مَنْ جَسَّاهَا And very he has lost, the one who, what's the word, to make it filthy, جَسَّاهَا, to make it impure. He does evil. He does that which Allah Taala doesn't like. And as a result of that, his soul, becomes affected. The mafia or the disobedience to Allah, what happens is, if you are a person who's been given to, going to see a woman who's haram for you, if your iman is real high or at a, you heard a lecture or something happened where your iman is high, if you gave yourself to go in to see a woman or to do something that's haram, as the Prophet said, whenever you do something evil, a black, Spot is put on your heart, and as long as you keep on doing evil, it keeps on going black, 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 black until finally it's black, and you're not able to distinguish from the ma'roof and the munka, from the haq and the batil, from the sunnah and the bid'ah. You don't even know. If you are a person who always watches TV, always, or video, what happens is you have no way of. Having your, in your, what do you call that, damir. What's that thing that talks to you? What do you call it? Your conscience will become sedated. Because it's like cigarettes. You know cigarette smoking? When you first pick up a cigarette and you inhale it, it hurts your chest. Tell your, your body, hey, I don't want this thing. This thing hurts. But if you force it and you keep smoking and keep smoking, the body says, okay, okay, you insist. And then it gets used to it. And the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this body like that as a rahmah for you in so many issues. So when you sit there and you watch the videos, look at women, or you listen to music, you become insensitive to what your soul would naturally tell you this is, com uh, this is something that's not good. So, the person who tries to stay away from this sin, and he's in that perpetual jihad of trying to be pious, you'll find it's not is up. But the person who gives himself to everything will find that he will never be able to feel that his head can look over the water. There's a famous scholar in Hadith. His name is Wakir Ibn Jarrah. He was a student. or well, he was the sheikh of Al-Imam al-Shafi'i. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i asked him. He said, Verily, I've been given the ability to memorize but I always forget. Can you give me some nasiha? He said, If you want to memorize then leave off doing evil. Allah Ta'ala tells us in so many eyes of the Qur'an that the one who has taqwa of Allah, not only will Allah be pleased with you and enter you the Jannah, but will also increase you in your sustenance. There's so many eyes of Allah in the, of the Qur'an like that. So the first thing is the fact that ma'asiyah, doing evil, will bring your iman down. Number two,
No doubt. The Prophet Sallallahu said, showed us that bad company will accept a man's iman. Iman. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-Mar'u ala deen khalili. Fayyandur ahadukum lilan yukhalil. Verily the man is on the religion of his friend. So let every one of you be careful and look at who he takes as a companion. Number three. Ahmed. Now, that company, same with the kuffar. Now, 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 disputing with the people, making your religion a deen of khasuma, a deen of jidan, a deen of munaqasha. You're always arguing with the people. You're extremely argumentative. That will definitely bring your iman down for sure. Fourth one, al jahil, ignorant. And with that, inshallah, we'll bring it to a close. If you brothers have any questions, inshallah, you can take this time to ask what you want to ask. Now. You know the, 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 the first of these mentions, Imam is sent to your back to five violence and words and things in the house. And then it says, Haya is part of the man. You know, from that hadith, can you take, as one of the men, all three from that, can you take as Haya as something in the house? <coughs> no doubt Hayat is from the heart, yes. No, no, no doubt. And it's taken as well. Now, it's one of those hadiths that can uh, show all three levels. To deliver for each and every definition of the Iman to Ahl Sunnah. Now, now for the deen. If you're in a of course, there are so many variables that come into play and that, you know, they have to be considered. And in these types of questions, it's difficult to get a straight, to give a straight answer just like that. The person needs to look at what the letter of the two evils would be for his particular situation. If he's in an environment where it's not conducive for his Islam and his Iman, and he finds that if he leaves that envi- environment, it's going to be a bigger figure that comes as a result, i.e., he works with Kufa. To leave that place at this particular time would mean that he's not going to be able to support himself. He will have to make that type of decision. But again, we always have to remember, Ikhwan, that the salaf of this ummah, there used to be a people who, if they had to make a choice between their deen and their dunya, they would always protect the deen at the expense of the dunya, and not vice versa. They would not protect their dunya at the expense of the, at the, at the expense of their deen. So what happens is, now, when it is said to a man, if you want to work here, then you have to cut your beard. The seller would have said, you can take your job and put it where you know where it belongs. He will never work with that person. You can't go to Salat al Jummah. You can't dress like a Muslim. You can't pray at the job. He will never take the job. As opposed to us, we right away are ready to compromise. And we go to the ayat, Hail in your heart, Allah is Ghafur Rahim, Allah is Talab Rahim, and so forth and so on. So, the person always has to remember that when it comes to your deen and your dunya, sacrifice and swear to your dunya at the expense of your deen. Do not give the people, do not give your people your deen. Don't give your deen up. Because again, Ikhwan, this dunya is fleeting, it's temporal, it's not going to be a long time. And there's a hadith. That the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, told us in the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu said, Yukta yom al qiyama bi an'am ahl al dunya wa ahl al nar. Fa yusbi'u fi al nar sabratan wa yukari lahu, ya fulan. Har ra'ita na'im al qat. Har marra bika khayr al qat. Fa yukul la wallahi. ما رأيت نعيم القط وما مر بي خير القط ثم يؤتى بأشد الناس بؤس في الدنيا من أهل الجنة فيصبغ في الجنة سبغة ويقال له يا طلال هل رأيت شدة القط هل مرت عليك صعوبة القط 
فيقول لا والله ما رأيت شدة قط وما مر علي قوة قط الله تبارك وتعالى فقسم في يوم القيامة the man that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala blessed in this life with the most money he gave him more money than anyone else there's no one else who had more money than him in the dunya period out of all the human beings he had more money of the people who are going to be in the hellfire of course there's going to be another man who had the most money of the people going to be in the paradise the father said the one who Allah gave him the most money in the dunya from the people of the hellfire yom of kiyana he will be brought He will be immersed or dipped into the hellfire. Before he has to go and stay forever, he will be dipped in and taken out. And then Allah will say to him, Hey, so and so, have you ever seen good in your life? Have you ever seen na'im? Ish na'im? Pleasure. Have you ever seen any pleasure? He will say, No, I swear by Allah, I've never seen any good in my life and I've never experienced any pleasure. And then the worst person who had the biggest problems in the dunya. He had the most difficult time of all the people in the dunya. That believer who lost his mother, his father, he could, every time he turned around there was a catastrophe knocking at his door. And none of us are this person, no doubt. None of us are this person. I mean, his life was the most difficult life of all the people. But he was a believer, he's from Ahmed Jannah, he's from Jannah. He will be dipped into the Jannah. And then he will be said to him, O oh, so-and-so, have you ever seen any difficulty in your life? Have you ever seen any hardship in your life? You will say, I swear by Allah, I have never seen nothing like that in my life. Because now the answer of both of those people is going to be relative to Jannah and Nah. So when he compares his problems in this life, his wife was disobedient, his wife was disrespectful, the problem sometimes he used to think, should I kill her or not? I'm going to kill her. He actually thinks like that. How can I kill her without getting caught? I mean, he had some serious problems over there. When he compares that with this, he sees, he says, his answer is going to be, I've never seen this, I've never seen that. So with that being the case, the Muslim knows that whatever someone is going to, put an ultimatum to him. Where is your dinah, your dunya? The Muslim protects his dunya at all costs, even if it's his life. He puts his life on the line. No. And you can explain to me there's a hadith that says um, zikr and blessings you have you put these in context what, what hadith is that? Yeah, that exactly right. yeah, like we told the brother last night and we told the brother today we have to be careful about these hadith we call them hadith murakkah it was in the book of um, Salih uh, yeah, you have to really you have to give me the text so that we can talk about it let's put the arsh thumma naqash We'll talk about it when we've established it, so. Um, and it doesn't come to my mind right now, so if you can find it. Now, I'm just fine. If you know the commission of Imam, leave in the house, saying with the lips, and the action, I do all commission those two. That's all I'm saying. Leave in the house, saying with the and action of the completeness of Imam, while they're commissioning Conditions mean what? Like, all three of them. Like, part, part of the mind. I mean, you have, you know. Now, what it's saying basically, again, is for a person's iman to be established, meaning for a person to be a mu'min. This mu'min is the ism of five. The one who has iman is a mu'min. The one who has Islam is a Muslim. The one who has Ihsan is a Muhsin. So the Muhsin and the Muslim and the Mu'min is the Ism of of this, what is known as a Muslim, the word. <coughs> so in order for a person to be called a Mu'min, a believer, he has to have this saying with his tongue where he said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulullah. And he has to have his actions also supporting what he just said. And he has to have the belief in his heart. <coughs> and to be a muhtin is of course the highest level. Oh. Uh, where is it at, Akhi? Right at the top. Uh, Al-Abi Darda radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qad. 
قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم ألا أنبئكم بخير أعمالكم وأزكاها عند مليسكم وأرفعها في درجاتكم وخير لكم من أنفاق الذهب والورق وخير لكم من أن تلقوا أدوكم فتضربوا أعلاقهم فتضربوا أعلاقهم ويضربون أعلاقكم قالوا بلى يا رسول الله قال ذكر الله ابو درداء ناوي يتتفاق صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم فاق شل انا انفرمي of the best of your deeds the truth in the sight of your sovereign من الله يا king the most superior in degree and the better for you than spending gold and silver and then facing your enemy and smiting the next or then smiting yours then i.e. the companion said yes so much of Allah tell us He said, it is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The remembrance of Allah. Here's the tape in which we came talking about the different levels of al-jihad. And in this tape, we explain to the people about not being like the man who was our, the man who was one eye. He looks at the text only with the eye that pleases him and he rejects everything else. So you find many, many hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that jihad is the best deed. For an example, the hadith of Mu'ad ibn Jabal. This hadith is in 40 hadith. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in this hadith, He said, رأس الأمر الإسلام وعموده الصلاة وذرة السلامه الجهاد في سبيل الله In this long hadith, he said to Jabal, uh, to Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Shall I not tell you the best deed? He said, yes. He said, the head of the affair is of Islam in the cause of Allah. And its pillar is الصلاة. And the peak of the matter is jihad fi sabilillah. Give us a salam. The salam is the thing on the camel his back that's up. So the peak of the matter is jihad fi sabilillah. So the person takes this hadith, along with so many other hadith, like everyone out of the people who Allah would allow to enter into paradise without any reckoning is the mujahid. He will not be asked, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you miss salat? Why did you make zina? He will not be asked. Allah will forgive him and enter him right into paradise without any question. The one who got shaheed. So they take these ayahs and there are many, many ayahs in hadith. But then we have other hadith like this. We have another hadith where the Prophet said, the man came and he asked the Prophet, what was the best deed? Ayyu amalin afdal. What is the best deed? The Prophet said, as-salat ala waqtiha. Pray the Salah at its prescribed time, at its earliest time at its prescribed time. So we have a lot of hadith where the Prophet said the best thing was this, or the best thing was that, or the best thing was this. Whenever we look at these hadith, we have to say that at that particular instant, the Prophet was talking to a particular person, telling that particular person that the Salah was the best thing for him. Or whatever was mentioned as being the best thing was the best thing for him. But in this hadith here, where he clearly states that jihad is less and sadaqa is less but only gives us one alternative and that's the alternative to say that the dhikr of Allah is what? the karim of the those things that are the dhikr that tell us about la ilaha illallah are in some shape, form or fashion they're connected to la ilaha illallah because in the hadith it's clear when the Prophet Muhammad said shall not form, form of the best of your deeds the purest in the sight of your sovereign uh, uh, your, your, your king the most superior in decree and better than you the spinning gold and silver Z- zakat and you facing your enemy jihad you killing them and them killing you and that's we have to take this he mentioned uh, spending we would say as-salat meaning the thicker of Allah as-salat as well as the shahada the first, first two pillars of Islam are what mentioned or meant by the thicker of Allah here no doubt, salah is 
more reward or more important, more weightier than jihad in the scales of al-Islam. No doubt about that. Salat is a pillar. There's no Islam without Salat. If a person leaves Salat, he disbelieves the Kafir. If a person leaves Jihad, he's an evil person and he's making his sin. But he doesn't become a Kafir. Islam can exist without Jihad. Even though its existence will be what? Zul. What's Zul? Lowly. Disrespected. As the Prophet told us in our authentic Hadith,